Okay, hello everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight we are continuing in our study of the book of John. Uh, if you have not seen the previous episodes, uh, they are already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I hope you will go back and watch those. Uh, so far, we've only covered 14 verses. Uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Uh, some of these things in John are just so deep that just a few verses can take an hour to, to discuss. So I, I hope you will go back and watch those. And for that matter, um, I'm attempting to do these live broadcasts daily now, or I should say nightly, uh, 7 p.m. Pacific time. That's If you're on the East Coast, that would be 10 p.m. your time. Uh, we're going to try to keep them to about an hour long and do them daily. Uh, so we're studying the book of John. Uh, other nights we're studying uh, the book of Proverbs or the, uh, the, the book of Job. And we just started a, a topic uh, recently, too, called Early Church History. And we've did, done one episode on that so far. So uh, join us nightly uh, for these Hangouts. Now, if you, if you uh, look at my channel, the, the rules of the Hangout, and if you uh, uh, believe the same core doctrines and you can follow the, the, the rules, then you're welcome to click on that and join us in the discussion. Uh, otherwise, I uh, you hope you will just watch. Uh, before we get started, let me ask these two brothers here to introduce themselves to the audience and say hi. Uh, go ahead, whoever wants to go first. I'm Neo. Uh, I love these guys. That's it. I'll just... Hello, it's me again, the Holmo. Uh, FYI, D E H A L L M O. Okay, back to you. <laughs> Okay. Uh, all right. So um, I'm assuming that if you're watching, you're probably subscribed to my channel, Sin City Preacher. But I want to uh, urge you all to also subscribe to Neo Cloud and DeHolmo. Please subscribe to their channels. Okay. Now, without further ado, let's pick up. Uh, I'm a what uh, Brother Joe Byron terms as a uh, KJV firstist. So I always want to look at the King James Version first. But I'm not against looking at the translation, so I probably will spend some time looking at the Amplified in addition to that. So let's look at, starting with verse 15, uh, it says, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Oh boy, there's an awful lot of concepts in that one verse. Let me read it again slowly and then let then ask you guys to respond to it. John, that being John the Baptist, said, John bear witness of him, that being Jesus, and cried saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Okay guys, uh, what's your first reaction to that verse there? Hey, I gotta take care of something real quick, but yeah, uh, before me, I get the whole interpretation of it, meaning uh, the things are already set in place before uh, people understand why they're happening. Yeah, and uh, even though those uh, Jehovah's Witnesses totally uh, ruined uh, verse uh, one. They, they can't get around verse 15 now, can they? Because he was before me. He was from everlasting to everlasting. Okay, back to you. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, when it says, um, uh, for he was before me, uh, we, that certainly cannot be misinterpreted to mean that he was born before him, because we know that John the Baptist was actually born before Jesus. He's a little bit older, a few months older than Jesus. So he, it couldn't, he couldn't say he was before me in birth, and it, it couldn't be interpreted to mean that he was before me in his ministry, because John the Baptist had his ministry before Jesus started his. So the only way that uh, we can uh, take that part that says he was before me is in context to the whole chapter in verses 
uh, 1 and 2 when it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so we establish in those first few verses that this is that Jesus Christ is eternal God Almighty. So in that sense, he was before him. Uh, there's more to the verse, though, but let me get your reaction to just that one part there. Very good, Brother Luke. Uh, there's just no way out of it. Uh, to be following the ridiculous doctrines of men that say otherwise is just uh, total tomfoolery. Okay, back to you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, now let's look more at the first part of it. It says, John bear witness of him. And as we study this further, we find out that this John that um, is, um, I don't know of any last name for John. I just know that his, his mother uh, is the uh, aunt, I think, of, of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Um, and so they are cousins. Uh, but uh, this John, the, the Baptist, uh, is who is speaking here, and the more we learn about him, we're going to find out that he is the one that was prophesied as the person who would come before the Messiah to introduce the Messiah to the world. And that's what he's done here. As we've, we've gone through uh, these previous chapters, that's what we established back in, you know, said, uh, uh, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. And then it says, that uh, and verse 15, jar, John bear witness of him. So uh, John uh, is the witness to introduce Jesus to us, and he said, he's, he says in verse 15, and cried, saying, this was he of whom I spake. So he's been talking about the Messiah's coming, and he points to Jesus, and this is whom I speak. This is the Messiah I've been telling telling you is coming. He that cometh after me, in other words, I started my ministry and before him, uh, but it says, is preferred before me. He's preferred, obviously, means he's 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 greater than me. He's uh, And uh, we're, we're going to find out more about that uh, as we go along, too. But it says, he, he cometh after me and is preferred before me, for he was before me. All right, before we go on, anything else you want to tell me about that verse? Uh, I'm good, Brother Luke, but I was curious, though. Uh, does anybody know exactly how uh, much uh, younger uh, Christ was than John the Baptist? Uh, I... Uh, I can't tell you off the top of my head at, uh, the details and, 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 and prove it to you right now, but I just recall that, uh, uh, see, I'm kind of putting two and two together. Mary went to see his aunt, uh, what was John's mother's name? I forgot, whatever her, his mother's name was. She went to see him, and the... the, the um, the mother, the aunt said that uh, he's kicking in the womb. Uh, John the Baptist, the baby, uh, in the womb is, kick, is kicking because he's excited that uh, Mary's there. And uh, um, I don't know, maybe in this chapter, in the coming chapters, uh, you know, this will all be spelled out and, and, and I'll get, be able to tell you the exact verses where I'm coming to this conclusion. But it seems that, that uh, she was pregnant just before... Mary got pregnant, and so I think it was a matter of months, less than a year. All right, uh, let's go on to the next verse. Uh, verse. Uh, oh, let me look at that in the Amplified before we move on. Amplified, verse 15, says... Uh, John testified repeatedly about him and has cried out testifying officially for the record with validity and relevance 
This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I and has priority over me, for he existed before me. All right. Um, was that like uh, as if Jesus existed since the beginning as the word? Yeah. Uh, yeah, while well, you stepped away, I elaborated on that further. On the, the question was... Um, how could Jesus be before him? If Jesus was born after him, we couldn't take, misunderstand thinking that Jesus was born before John because John was a little bit older than Jesus. I, I believe that can be proven. Uh, and then we couldn't, uh, we couldn't misunderstand and think that uh, when John says he was before me, that Jesus' ministry started before John's ministry because we know that John had his ministry coming before Jesus started his. So we relate verse 15 back to verses 1, 2, and 3 when it talks about uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, showing us that Jesus is eternal, God Almighty. So that's the sense that we see that Jesus was before him. Um, don't you also, there's another scripture that comes to mind as a cross-reference that I heard somebody use before. Uh, Jesus as a child knew many things and surprised a lot of the elders at the church. If you remember that, too. He was very he was very skilled, like, uh, understanding. He knew a lot of things when he was a child. Yeah. Now, now, now that can get us off into, a, like, an entire theological subject or discussion that would be really interesting. Uh, but to, I'll, I'll c concisely tell you my thoughts on it, that... Uh, um, when Jesus was born, he was just like a regular baby. I mean, he had to learn to speak. He had to learn to walk. I mean, he didn't have uh, the, um, the abilities that, that uh, he had as an adult uh, at birth. And, and, and that also uh, applies to his knowledge. Uh, he had to acquire knowledge. Uh, but... He, he learned at the temple. It shows that he was studying at the temple, but they were amazed at his understanding of the scriptures. So I don't think that uh, Jesus in his youth uh, had retained the omniscience of God, that he knew everything, because it says that he had set aside his godness, in a sense, and became secondary, sub subject yeah. So um, he did have a great ability, but he did not have all of his ability as a child, and even even as Jesus, he, he couldn't necessarily, uh, he did not have omniscience. He did not have omnipotence at that point, because he set aside part of his uh, omnipotence uh, to be a man. Yeah, and that goes along with what I was going to say, is um, because he was tested by Satan before he had met John. So, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, he was he was tempted, and uh, as a man, uh, you know, he could have very well succumbed to the temptation. But the advantage that he did have, even though his, I, I don't want to say, I don't, I don't want to another word for it. There, I'm sure that in the scriptures we'll come across a verse that uses a word that's correct, for what I'm trying to say, but for since I can't recall it, I'm going to call it his godness. Now he was fully God and fully man, but we know that he set us set it aside. He set aside certain abilities, um, so that he could live as a man. Uh, and so part of that means that he had to be tempted, just as a man is is tempted. But the advantage he had is that he didn't have a sin nature. And we established in the very first one or two uh, studies of this that the sin nature comes from the seed of man, not from the seed of a woman. And Jesus did not have the seed of a man contribute to his, his um, uh, birth. There was no seed of a man. It was an immaculate conception. So because he did not have the seed of a man, he did not inherit a sin nature. All right, we covered, we went into that a little bit last time. All right, let me go on now to the next uh, verse. Uh, I'm going to look at it, go back to the KJV for verse 16. Sorry to distract you, I didn't mean to. 
Well, it's okay. It's all right to go off on tangents a little bit, as long as you wouldn't get totally distracted, you know. Um, now, okay, that was 15. Verse 16 says, And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. So let me read that in context with verse 15 first. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. All right. Who's going to attempt to explain that one? Yeah, I wanted to say, like, uh, uh does the baptism make it complete? I know I'm jumping ahead here a little bit, but you know, from what we're talking about, this progression of Jesus' character as we go through the Bible, you know what I'm saying? It, when, it, when it comes to what John's talking about, I think it's, you know, it's like it's, it's saying that this was supposed to happen, this is the way, because like you said, Jesus had a, a God as his father, unlike the men, so therefore... Um, that the baptism made it complete? Well, I think we there's uh, there's a good argument for that, that the baptism was when the, we first have the Holy Spirit come onto the scene. And this is one of the reasons that I uh, don't hold to modalism. Um, modalism believes that we have one God, and he operates in three different modes. Um, he has a mode of operation as the Father, and then he can change into a different mode of operation and becomes the Son. And then he can change into a different mode of operation and become the Holy Spirit. But we know that at the baptism, we have all three persons of the Godhead present. We, we have Jesus being baptized. We have the Father speaking here from above. And then we have the Holy Spirit ascending in the manner of a dove. So we all have all three aspects of God, all three persons of, of the Godhead present at one time and place. Uh, that's one of the reasons that I hold to tr the triunity or the Trinitarian uh, doctrine. Uh, but at that baptism, I think that there is a good uh, support that that's when he received his, his uh, powers for his ministry. Just like when, when you receive the Holy Spirit, uh, you receive uh, not only the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling, the sealing of the Spirit, now the Spirit's in you, and you're capable of doing things that you couldn't do before because the Spirit is working in you. And then we can pray for the filling of the Spirit, and that's asking God to give us power for a particular uh, mission. Uh, so I, I think that there is support for the idea that at the baptism, we know that's when his ministry kicked in. He wasn't ready to do a ministry, and that's until he got the baptism. And then, so he was not only baptized with water, he was baptized with the Holy Spirit at that time too, as we are. Uh, so, what's your? Do uh, you think I'm off on any of that, either of you? No, go ahead, Eric. Sorry to take all the mic time. Uh, no apologies necessary. Now, uh, are you saying that uh, at the time he was baptized and the Holy Spirit came down upon him, that was the time that he was anointed for his uh, ministry? Uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay, I'll buy that. Okay. All right, so now I want to read... Uh, these three verses together so we can get this context of these three verses. It says, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, this is interesting because uh, I'm looking at this on uh, Bible Hub. You have your actual King James Bible there, right? Well, if, if you have a King James Red Letter Bible, we see that 
somebody decided to put some of the letters in red. And if it's in red, there's, these are supposed to be the actual words of Jesus. Uh, if they weren't in red, sometimes you can get, get confused and you're not sure if it's Jesus speaking or is it the Apostle John who's, who's writing this gospel account yep. or, is it still, or is it John the Baptist that's still talking? So it's easy to get confused as to who's actually speaking at this time. And this is one of those times, well, we know it, uh, it's not red letters uh, in the Bible, so the whoever published and translated that King James Bible, they, they didn't designate this as red. This is not the words of Jesus. Uh, but so now we have to determine, is this still John the Baptist talking? Uh, not, actually, it's not John the Baptist talking at any point, because this says, John bear witness of him and cried, saying, now the only th part that we, we can take from verse 15 that's John speaking is the words, this was he of whom I spake, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now, now verse 16, if we continue, is this still John the Baptist talking? Or is this John's commentary, this next verse, and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. My uh, opinion is that verse 16 and 17 are no longer the words of John the Baptist, but the writing of John in the Gospel. I'd like to get your reaction to that. I'm reading some Gill's exposition. For some reason, I'm just going through other people's you know, thoughts about this. Not that I believe everything I read. Um, he's saying in the fullness, and of his fullness have all we received, he said, these are the words, not of John the Baptist, but of the evangelist carrying on his account of Christ. Uh, that's that's uh, the point I asked. And that, I told you, I took the position that this these are the words of John the, the Apostle, uh, not John the Baptist and not the words of Jesus. So uh, Gil is, is in agreement with me, or should I say I'm in agreement with Gil, because he... He's probably goes back. I don't know when did he write that, but uh, now when you t when you bring in Gill uh, or Barnes or any of these commentators, it's like having that person sit down in this conversation with us, and and just as I am commenting and giving my thoughts on the scripture, we get the thoughts of Gill. So I welcome it. Now there are people that object to using commentaries, and they say that's not scripture. But guess what? The words you say and Eric says and I say, they're not scripture either. We're adding our comments uh, and our interpretations and even uh, as it says in the Amplified Translation, we're amplifying our thoughts on it. So I welcome any commentaries. We can take a look at it. But some of these commentators, uh, if we look at a lot of them, we'll see that they bring in their biases to their preconceived uh, doctrines. But before we go on, let me see who this is with us here. It's... Uh, Positively something. Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah, this is my good friend, uh, Positively Godless. His name is Scott. He's a nice guy. He's got, um, he's, you know, he, he's got his different views, but that's all right. I just, you know. Well, I want to ask, uh, okay, you're Scott. Uh, yeah. Did you read, did you read the, uh, uh, the Statement of Faith and the, the Rules of the Hangout, Scott? I did, yes. Did, yes. Okay, and are you in agreement with it completely? Um. Sorry, my dogs are freaking out. Um, am I agreement with the complete? Probably not, but um, I saw a new one here, so I figured I'd stop in and say hello. All right. Well, you can say hello, but but this this is uh, really intended for only the people who agree with uh, the statement of faith. So um, uh, you're welcome to just uh, listen if you like, but uh, sure. that's 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 the rules of the hangout. Yeah, I'm not sure how long I'm gonna stay, but you know, I just wanna make you know say hello. Okay. I would agree. If you want to hear something about the Bible, that's great. Yeah. Cool. All right. And uh, any who, thank you. All right. So uh, now we looked at those three verses in context: 15, 16, and 17. And I think that is, uh, 17 is important to understand uh, related to 16 because if we take 16 by itself, it says, "And of his fullness have we all received." Well, this is John reflecting back. Just like when in the first few verses, 
it's not contemporary. Uh, it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. That's not, you know, like Jesus is right there in the conversation with John and the ministry is going on. He's going back in time to the very beginning before creation. And just right here, this is also not contemporary. Uh, John is writing, explaining the concept of Jesus. He says, and of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. Now, I'm not sure what and grace for grace means. I would like to hear Gil's commentary if you have that. But then in verse 17 it says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And that's something we agree with in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the mosaic, the, the Judaism and uh, um, uh, the laws of Moses. Uh, that was before Jesus came and died for our sins. Um, all right, I'm going to look at it in the Amplified, but while I'm looking, uh, if you have any comments on that, go ahead and, and talk, please. Yeah, I totally... Oh, go ahead, Eric. Uh, well, I was just going to say, uh, verse 16 is very intriguing. Uh, it's very short and simple, but... Uh, Grace for grace. What, what can you make about that? All right. I'm going to read it in the Amplified, and maybe it'll be helpful to us. And if, if Neo is, uh, wants to uh, tell us what the uh, Gill's commentary says, I, I welcome that too. But let me read it now in the Amplified. I'm going to read the three verses together. It says, John testified repeatedly about him and has cried out, testifying officially for the record with validity and relevance. This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I and has priority over me, for he existed before me. Uh, for, now that, that was in quotes, uh, John's words. And then it says, for out of his fullness, the superabundance of his grace and truth, we have all received grace upon grace. That's spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, favor upon favor, and gift heaped upon gift. For the law was given through Moses, but grace, the unearned and undeserved favor of God, and truth came through Jesus Christ. Uh, that seemed quite helpful to me. Um, what about you guys? Uh, did, that, did that help you all to understand those verses? Yeah, I don't, I don't totally agree with Gill's exposition or anything like that, but I was just reading it and trying to get a little contrast going, you know, maybe. Uh, there's there's some other, uh, like, pulpit commentaries, you know, on Bible Hub, and there's other, like, eSword, if you ever used that before. There's a couple other um, ways. But th there is definitely, you can tell, a, a mistranslation when it comes to the NIV sometimes. Um, this verse is... is like radically different in NIV. It's well, uh, feel free to read it to us so we can see that if you like. Sure, give me a second. My math screwed up. But go ahead, Eric, while I do this. Well, uh, the amplified version uh, takes quite a few liberties as well, in my opinion. We're talking about uh, 117? Yeah, it, the Amplified is taking the same liberty that you and I are taking as we comment on the verses. All we are doing is amplifying the verse according to our own thoughts and interpretation. And uh, whoever is the writer or interpreter of a uh, translator of the Amplified, that's what they're doing. They're amplifying. It's like reading the scriptures with the commentary already built into the verse. That's the Amplified. Uh, so, do, do you disagree with any of the Amplified's uh, phraseology of it? I, I, I don't find any fault in it. Do you, Eric? Well, not necessarily, but uh, I would think that they would uh, have to have some sort of disclaimer uh, in their uh, publication about that. Well, I, they, if you read the preface to the Amplified Bible, it, I, if I had one here right now, if you read the preface to it, 
you probably would find that kind of disclaimer there. They probably explain that some of these things don't don't take it as scripture. These are our own interpretations, and we're trying to expound upon it and, and amplify it. Um, okay, brother Neo, did you uh, now? If you want to look at read Gill or, or any other commentary, if you think that'll help us to understand these, I I welcome it. Oh no, I was just I was just saying that sometimes the NIV or the New Living Translation gets some things very wrong to me, just because King James and, and some other versions of King James Bibles um, make t more sense to me. Like, before I uh, believed, the, the King James didn't make any sense, but when I started to believe more, then I, the King James made more sense than the rest of them did, because when it says, for the, are you talking about uh, John one seventeen? are we on now? Yeah, uh, 15, 16, and 17, we're, lo we're looking at all together. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Now, that's the New American Standard Bible. Now, if you read the King James, it says, For the law was given unto Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Those are, those are two, really two different things to me. When you say truth were realized through Jesus Christ, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. When you say... Jesus Christ, you know, is grace and truth. That it makes it more powerful sounding. It makes it more solid of a foundation to work with, because the word "realized" can be misinterpreted a thousand times when it comes to the, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I I've said this. Uh, I mean, I, I say this pretty much every broadcast. I I describe myself and identify as a KJV firstist. Now, I've been saved for 29 years, and for about 25 or 26 years, I was a staunch KJV onlyist. And I was schooled by Dr. Peter Ruckman. I have about 40 of his books, and I know all the arguments that to, to show you that KJV onlyism is the right way to be. Um, and so, and I argued for that position for years, um, and then over the last few years, I've moved away from it. And I, I, I'm not going to try to explain to everybody why I, I have a different viewpoint out now, but I, what I do now is I want to read the KJV first because I, I trust the manuscripts more, uh, and I, I want to use it as my test. And uh, but I think if I limit myself only to it, then I'm I'm hurting myself be, uh, because, frankly. You know, I, I've said this before. I hope it doesn't come off as being braggadocious, but but I am I'm a pretty educated person. I'm more educated than some people that might have a more difficult time with with language, with with English and and old English. But even with my level of education, I find as I read the KJV, there are certain verses, especially as we've been studying Proverbs and Job. Uh, there's many times we've come across verses that. Uh, I'm either not so sure or I'm stumped completely. And I find it helpful to, to, to let me go look at another translation. And I, the one I like to, for that purpose is the Amplified. Um, so, but the, it's true what you're saying. There are many cases we can show where the, the NIV or the NASB or some of these other translations, the, the, it is really, it, it's really blatant, a blatant thing. Like they, they leave out some of the most important verses in the scripture, like First John 5, 7. It says, uh, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. That verse is not even in there. Verse 7 is not even in the NIV or the NASB. And it's the most important verse declaring the Trinity. So there's other examples that we could give, but that's why I, I will always look at the KJV first, and I'll test the others against it, but uh, I don't want to limit myself to it. Uh, okay, before we go on, anything else to be said about any of that? Um, you know, I'm gonna. I'm actually just want to say goodbye. I'm gonna bow out. I just don't want to make anyone uncomfortable or anything like that. So, you know, you guys are in your zone. So I want to make sure I be respectful to that. So, but thank you for having me in. All right, thank you for joining us, and uh, uh, it's nice meeting you. Yeah, likewise. Like, a, have a good night. You too. Bye. Okay, uh, so brother Neo and, and Eric, uh, anything before we move on to the next verse? Well, that's, uh, I think, where half the battle is uh, back in uh, the manuscripts. Uh, it's the same with the Old Testament. Uh, half the battle goes back to the manuscript. Uh, 
and that's where most uh, most of the division uh, begins, and uh, that's where most of the problems begin, and that's where most of the bloodshed uh, has happened. Okay, back to you. All right, then. Let me go on. Um, okay, I'm going back to the KJV now to go on. Uh, we'll look at the next verse. Um, it's verse uh, 18. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, hath he hath declared him. Uh, now, this is a really interesting verse. Uh, and someone like Brother Evan, um, who, who believes in uh, soul sleep, um, he sent me about 50 verses uh, to support soul sleep that I considered, and uh, he has not won me over to that side. Uh, but um, it's a verse like this that, that Evan and others might use to support that. Uh, it says, um, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Uh, no man hath seen God at any time. Now, like a Muslim might use that verse and say, you see, uh, if no man has seen God at any time. That means that people saw Jesus, so Jesus must not be God. Uh, someone who believes that we do not, we uh, when we die, we do not directly go to be with God in heaven. Uh, they would use that verse and say, you see, uh, no man's seen God. That means everybody who's died is still sleeping, waiting for the resurrection, and they haven't seen God in heaven yet. So that's how that verse could be interpreted by those people. Um, but uh, what's your response to that before I give you my opinion on it? Well, uh, technically, when you're dead, you're no longer a man. So uh, that takes care of that argument. And as far as uh, stating that no man has seen God at any time, uh, their state of fact, which was uh, stated in the Old Testament, and we know that Jesus is the express image of the Father. Okay, back to you. Okay, bro Brother Neil, any comment on that? Okay, maybe he stepped away, or 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 maybe he stumped. Sometimes I get stumped on a verse. Let me. Okay, let me. Uh, I'm going to read verse uh, verse 8, 19 along with it too, so we have more context. It says, And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? Okay, so that does not have anything to do with the context. So verse 18, we can stop right there and, and discuss it. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Um, all right, let me look at it in the Amplified and see how that ex states it. Okay. Um, no one has seen God, his essence, his divine nature at any time. The one and only begotten God, that is, the unique Son who is in the intimate presence of the Father, he has explained him and interpreted and revealed the awesome wonder of the Father. Okay, uh, Brother Eric, now what's your reaction to the Amplified uh, on that verse? Uh, I think that's fine. I think that will do in a pinch. Uh, I think it's it's before I read it, that's how I would have explained the verse in my own words. So when I read it, it comforted me thinking that, well, hey, maybe I'm understanding this right. And because after I read the Amplified, it's, it's stating basically how I was seeing it. Now, the way you answered it, uh, no, one, no man has seen God uh, is because... Uh, because when we die, we're no longer a man. Well, I mean, I could see how you could apply that. Uh, you're not 
completely a man because you're you're not resurrected yet. Now, some people believe that when we die, we go to uh, we go immediately to heaven with with God, and we have a temporary intermediate body. I'm not going to go into all that right now, but I mean, so we either we know we do not have a resurrected body, right? Because the resurrection hasn't happened. So we either go there as a disembodied spirit or soul, or we are still in asleep in the grave, as Brother Evan would say, in soul sleep, or we go to heaven and we're there with a temporary body, because uh, and rather than being a disembodied spirit. These are the, the op possible options. Uh, but uh, so if you're correct, well, you can no longer define him as a man. But I think that's a, kind of an easy way out. I don't, I don't really, I'm not really satisfied by, by that answer. I think it's no man has seen God in terms of his fullness, the fullness of the Godhead, everything. The, the understanding, even Moses couldn't look completely at God because if he saw in his, in his fullness, I think the scripture says he would die, right? Anything on before I go on? Anything more? Right. Absolutely, Brother Luke. Uh, and because God is eternal. And how can you view God who is eternal unless you are eternal as well? Um, all right. I'm going to go on now. Let me see. I'll go back to the KJV for the next verse. Uh, now we're on verse uh, verse 19. It says, and this is the record of John. Now, this is not the record of John the Baptist. We've got these two Johns here, and we have Jesus, and we have the Word, and we have God, and all these different uh, characters are being... Uh, you know, mentioned, and when it says, and this is the record of John, let's not think that this is the record of John the Baptist. This is a record of the Apostle John. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So John the Baptist is being asked who he is, and he says, I'm not the Christ. Later on, I think it's in Luke 9.20, since I have that on my license plate on my car, Luke 9.20. Um, uh, it also appears, I think, you in Matthew or Mark. The question Jesus asked, sent his, his disciples and apostles across the country to tell people uh, to to preach, and, and and when they came back, Jesus said, well, who, who are they saying I am? And the apostles reported, well, some say that you're, you know, uh, Elijah, or, or you're or you're that prophet, or, or, or uh, I forgot what they all, they gave their various answers. But then Jesus asked, well, but who do you say that I am? And Peter is the one that spoke him and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So that's, see, when Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? And, uh, you know, the answer is, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, 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 and Jesus declared that's true. And I know you didn't get this from, from man, from your own conclusions, that God told you this. God revealed this to you. And yet, the interesting thing I found is that Peter was not the first one to call him the Christ. Uh, uh, we're going to find out as we go through this that someone else called him the Christ when he was in a boat. I, I don't remember exactly which time, which boat, but uh, Peter's given credit for the first one to say, oh, you're the Christ. And yet, I, I've never understood why he gets all that credit when another apostle already said that uh, prior, prior to that event. Uh, but... Uh, the, the question asked here to John the Baptist is, who are you? And he says, I'm not the Christ. Because I guess people were considering the possibility that maybe John the Baptist is the Christ. He's the Messiah that was promised. But he, he denies it, says, no, it's not me. 
but he's the one that will introduce the Christ. Okay, brother, anything before I move on? That's very interesting, Brother Luke, because uh, the way that verse is worded, it's obvious that the Pharisees and such were looking for the Messiah at that time. Now, we know that Daniel nailed it down to the very day, and I believe he nailed it down to the very second. Okay, back to you. Yeah, and uh, what you're what you're alluding to for those people who have not studied that is Daniel's prophecy of uh, uh, the, the seventy weeks of years uh, when Jesus came into Jerusalem uh, and they laid the palm leaves out and he was riding on the ass. That that was his uh, de the declaration that the King has come, the Messiah has come. And that's the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel, uh, but that's something that you everybody you'll have to study on your own uh, because it, it would take it would take many hours to even ex explain all the details of that. Uh, but you're 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 right uh, that that was all prophecy. Um, so they're expecting the Messiah to come, and they're wondering is this ba baptizer, this John, that's baptizing. Is, could he possibly be? They ask him who he is, and he says, he clears the air right then. says, no, I'm not the Christ. But we find out that he's the one that's going to introduce the Christ. And he does identify Jesus. Uh, he already mentioned him in a prior verse, and there's a point where he says, he's going to point and say, there he is, the one I've been talking about, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That verse is coming up. Uh, let me look at that in the Amplified now. Amplified. Okay. It says, uh, uh, the, the thing about the Amplified too I find interesting is that it has titles of chapters and subtitles. Like the title of this chapter is The Deity of Christ. And then there's a subtitle before verse 6, it says, The Witness of John the Baptist. The title before verse 14, it says, The Word Made Flesh. And then now the title before verse 19, it says, The Testimony of John. These titles, these titles and subtitles should not be misconstrued as part of the scripture. If, if you're reading a Bible and you see the titles, uh, they, they uh, don't put as much confidence in those titles as you do their scripture itself, just like you don't want to put a lot of confidence in the footnotes or the side notes on a Bible, because uh, those comments are there inserted by commentators and interpreters, and it, it's it, just like you should not put more weight in the words I'm telling you, or the words that Brother Eric is telling you, or Brother Neil, we're giving you our, our opinions, and our opinions are opinions, they're not scripture. But this subtitle says, the testimony of John, and verse 19 says, this is the testimony of John the Baptist, when the Jews sent priests and Levites to him from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed truthfully, and did not deny that he was only a man, but acknowledged, I am not the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed. Okay, so, see, that is that is helpful. Uh, you know, I know that you're, uh, Brother Eric, I do appreciate your caution about, uh, you know, the Amplified or some other translation. It's good to be cautious and, uh, and uh, not necessarily, the, don't take it as the Word of God necessarily, you know, but... Yeah, are, can you agree that sometimes it's very helpful when you read the Amplify? It amplifies it, and, and you get a little better explanation than you did on, on without it. At least sometimes. Oh, brother Luke, absolutely, and we can accurately and acceptably paraphrase, paraphrase scripture because that precedent was set. Uh, set by the apostles uh, when uh, quoting uh, Old Testament scripture. Okay. Well, that's a very good point. I'm glad you said that, and I'll take it a step further. Even Jesus paraphrased scriptures. He quoted he when he quoted the Old Testament, didn't he? Amen, brother. 
forgive me for forgetting that uh, point. Okay. All right. So now let's let's go on to. Uh, uh, let me see. I'm now. I'm going to go back to the KJV for the next verse. It's a little cumbersome going back and forth, but uh, it's helpful. Uh, and then in verse 21, they say it says, "And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias?" That's another name for Elijah, the prophet Elijah, or or is that Isaiah? It might be Isaiah. Um, Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. So I think that uh, when it says he says Elias, it's probably referring to maybe Elias or uh, uh, Elisha, maybe. And, and he says, Art thou that prophet? He maybe he's referring to Elijah or Isaiah. But to, to both questions, uh, John the Baptist answers, No. And then it says in verse 22, Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? All right, I'm going to look at it in the Amplify, but then I'm waiting for your reaction to all that, brother. Uh, yes, brother Luke. Uh, they knew as well that uh, Elijah, that's referring to Elijah as Malachi prophesied, and they knew that he would come before Christ to prepare the way, and so they uh, had to uh, ask him about that as well. Okay, now we're going to find out these names, I think, in this Amplified, maybe. It says, okay, uh, Amplified says, uh, and he confessed truthfully and did not deny that he was only a man, but acknowledged, I am not the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? So uh, that explains that first one. Uh, uh, what was Elias is Elijah and then and, and he said I am not are you the promised prophet uh, the promised prophet hmm maybe that is the question about uh, uh, the Messiah I don't know uh, no that why would they ask him that uh, question are you the promised prophet are you that prophet Okay, and he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Tell us that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And now we come to the, the declaration. Really, the, one, one of the most important things that John the Baptist ever says. Let me go back to the KJV first for it. Okay, so KJV, verse 23. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah." And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? Okay, so um, before I go on to the uh, Amplified here, I'll read this again in the KJVs. Verse 23 says, He, that's John the Baptist, said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. Okay, brother, before I go on, what's your response to that? Uh, brother Luke, it's interesting that they, uh, they have three different uh, persons in mind. Uh, I wasn't aware of a third uh, uh foretold about prophet uh, were you no I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit confused uh, when it says that prophet and Eli, Elias um, uh, 
there, I know that there is more than one, but when he, I, I was disappointed in the amplifier that it did not s identify who that prophet is when it says that prophet. Um, because there is a prophet that's foretold, and that's the one that's going to introduce Jesus. And then that's who he actually he says, well, this is who I am. I'm, I'm a voice crying in the wilderness. And uh, how, did, how is it phrased again here? Uh, um, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. So Isaiah uh, is, I think, the prophecy that there will be a forerunner, someone to introduce the Messiah. Um, maybe as we go along, this will be more clear to us. But let me look at it in the Amplified. Amplified. Okay. Um, it says, uh, Then they said to him, Who are you? Tell us so that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one shouting in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So they say this, Elias is Isaiah. Well, and I'm then they say, huh? I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, you go ahead. I was, want your reaction to that. I was just going to say, yeah, that's correct. Uh, Isaiah is Isaiah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me read this last part here and that, and then we'll close here. He says, uh, Why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Uh-oh. Um, verse 26 is where I want to pick up next time. Okay. Let me make a note of this, because verse 26 is really important. Right, let's go. John, let me make a note here. My pen is not writing here. There it is, okay. John 1, verse 26 is where we'll pick up next time. I'm real excited about that verse, but people will probably go ahead now and, and look ahead and see where we're going. But All right, brother, uh, that was really interesting. And one thing that uh, you've probably learned, if you are, didn't already know this, about me and anybody watching right now, uh, maybe you knew this, maybe you just now discovered it, that I cannot explain every verse in the Bible. Uh, and I think it's unfortunate there are some people I encounter that seem to think that they are omniscient. They understand it all, and, and their understanding is perfect. They are infallible, uh, but I, I, I'm not going to make that claim. I don't understand every verse in the Bible, and some of the verses I'm absolutely convinced I know it. Others I have a, an opinion maybe a strong or a weak opinion, and some people, some verses, I throw up my hands and say, I'm sorry, I don't know. This is what some people say, but I have no no strong conclusion on it at all. So, um, and that's the way the Bible is. And I, I, I think that if we ever reach the point where we think that uh, we, we've got it all 100% right, and we, we're, then we're, we're just all puffed up. Um, but now let's talk about uh, the, the the gospel for a few moments before we close. Um, um, the book of John, as I covered at the very beginning of the study, uh, before we started even John, the first chapter, the first verse, we talked about why the book of John was written. It was written so that we can learn how we can receive eternal life. And uh, that's what the book of John is really all about, to tell us who Jesus is, what he's done for us, how we can get eternal life and go to heaven. And that's what we learn from this book, and that's why it's the most important book of the Bible. But I'm going to sum it all down into just a, a, a few uh, sentences. And that is that, it, it, are, are you trying to get to heaven 
through your personal merit. Do you think that the way you go to heaven is you die and then God judges you and he looks at your life and says, well, you're good enough, you can come in. You're not good enough, you got to go to hell. You're not quite good enough, go to hell. You're good enough, you get to go to heaven. If that's what you think, then guess what? You're like most of the people who've ever lived. Most people think we go to heaven as a reward for our good performance. And they, they believe in what we call the merit system. You, you go to heaven based on personal merit. But I, I've got bad news for you if, the, if that's what you think. One, if you're trying to get to heaven through personal merit, the standard you've got to meet is perfection. So that's the bad news, first of all. It's impossible to do it. So you have to understand that. The second thing you need to know is that the Bible says personal merit is not God's way for us. God's way is through faith in Jesus. So if you want to go to heaven, the first thing you've got to do is understand that it's impossible to get to heaven through personal merit, through your own. By You can join all the religions of the world. You, you can do all the religious, religious rites and rituals and practices and commandments, and you can become the most religious person in the world and follow it better than anybody else, and you'll still fail and fall short. That's what the Bible says. We all fall short of this glory of God, this standard of perfection. So we want you to understand that it's impossible and give up. And then you'll finally understand why you need Jesus. He's called the Savior for a reason. We're all doomed, but Jesus will save you. Jesus will get you to heaven. You can't do it, so Jesus did it for you. Now, he did a bunch of things for us. First of all, he's God Almighty, and he came down from heaven and became a man. He said the reason he did that was so that he could die for our sins. See, he, he had to become a man in order so, so it was possible to die. He died on a cross, and he paid for all our sins on that cross. So all the things you've been trying to abstain from in life and all the good things you've tried to do to counteract the bad things, uh, you know, that, that's doomed to failure. But what Jesus did was he paid for your failures. And he lived a perfect life that we could never live. So if you put your faith in him, your sins are paid for and his righteousness is attributed to you. Isn't that wonderful? That's what we get when we put our faith in Jesus. Uh, forgiveness and imputed righteousness. So uh, he died for our sins, but the good news is he did not stay dead in that tomb. After three days, he was raised from the dead, and he, he walked for 40 days, and there were hundreds of witnesses who ate with him and talked with him and touched him. He proved he would raised himself from the dead. And he said the reason for the resurrection is to give us a sign proving his claims are true, that he is God, that he does have the power over life and death, and that he promises life everlasting to you if you'll trust him. So that's what we're asking you to do today. Just simply stop trying to get to heaven on your own and give up and say, I'm going to, put my faith completely on Jesus instead. I'm going to trust him to get me there. I'm going to rely on him. I'm going to depend completely on Jesus. And when you do that, he gives you eternal life as a gift. Eternal life in heaven is not a reward for your good behavior. It is a gift you would get you get at the time you put your faith in Jesus. All right, and and the nice thing is once you receive it, you can never lose it for any reason because he says he he will never take it back. He will never leave you or forsake you. So if you put your faith in Jesus, you are absolutely guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. Brother, anything you want to say about that before we close? Well, Brother Luke, that's the best news I've heard all day. Thank you very much. All right. I don't know if Brother Neo is still with us or, or not. I'll give him a second to... Uh, say uh, good night to everybody if he's still there. Otherwise, all right, brother Eric, thank you for joining me again. 
And uh, everybody, please join us nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time, 10 p.m. Eastern time, one hour, studying the Bible and having fellowship. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.